Many arguments contain implicit premises or conclusions. That is, premises or conclusions that are unstated, but assumed to be true. An important skill we need to develop, then, is learning how to identify both of these. As a first step, we need to be able to distinguish between an implicit premise and mere background knowledge. Let's consider an example. Magpies should be exterminated because they sometimes steal other birds' eggs. It's very helpful to begin by putting an argument like this in standard form. Notice that there's one premise and a conclusion. A temptation might be to include something like the following, magpies are birds. While the arguer certainly assumes this to be true, but notice that this does nothing to close the logical gap between the premise and the conclusion. The given premise says that magpies sometimes steal other birds' eggs, while the conclusion says that magpies should be exterminated. Simply noting that magpies are birds doesn't really have anything to do with either of these. A much better candidate implicit premise is, birds that steal other birds' eggs should be exterminated. Notice how that closes the logical gap. In identifying implicit premises, remember that we're going to follow the principle of charity. This principle has two basic parts. First of all, the premise should close the logical gap between the stated premise or premises and the conclusion. And secondly, the premise should not commit the arguer to more than is necessary. The second part of the principle is especially important when we're identifying a more general principle that fits into the argument. Again, let's look at an example. John is lazy because he's a communist. Again, we have the argument in standard form. One general principle we might throw in here is, all communists are lazy. Now the reason that this is tempting is that including this principle makes the argument very strong. In fact, it's a valid deductive argument. However, the cost of that is that the second premise is almost certainly false. A much better second premise to fill in would be, communists tend to be lazy. While that might also be false, it's at least much more likely to be true than the first example, and it turns the argument into an inductive argument. Many arguments require that we fill in multiple implicit premises. For example, John jaywalked, so he should have to pay for his jail food. There's obviously quite a large gap between the claim that he jaywalked and the fact that he has to pay for his jail food. So for example, one thing that we'll want to note is that jaywalkers should be jailed. The arguer is certainly assuming that to be the case. So John jaywalked, jaywalkers should be jailed, that means John should be jailed, but we still have a gap between the fact that he should be jailed and the fact that he should have to pay for his jail food. That's where the third premise comes in. Those in jail should have to pay for their food. Notice that the arguer is assuming both of these things to be true. Finally, notice that many arguments have implicit conclusions. For example, philosophy majors make a lot of money, and I want to make a lot of money. Here we've put the argument in standard form by listing out the two given premises. We need to follow the principle of charity when identifying implicit conclusions just as much as we do when we are finding implicit premises. For example, one thing that we might want to conclude from this is, I ought to major in philosophy. Well, that might follow, but notice that what the premises give us is simply a reason to major in philosophy, but there might be other countervailing reasons for why I shouldn't. So really, a much more conservative conclusion to fill in here would be, I have good reason to major in philosophy. Much of the rest of the course will concern evaluating arguments. It is therefore necessary that we be able to identify all of the parts of arguments so that we can do this effectively.